Entropy and the Second Law of Thermodynamics. Let's set the tone by watching a drop of ink fall into a beaker of water. There's nothing at all unusual about what you're seeing. On the other hand, when you see this, you immediately know something's not right. You know it's not natural. Clearly, I'm running the video in reverse. Keep this in mind as we go forward. This is an exceptionally deep and wide subject. Listen to some of these topics that are addressed with entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. The asymmetry between future and past, also known as the arrow of time, evolution versus creationism, heat death of the universe, and heat engine efficiency. And there are a great many varieties of heat engines, including the human body, weather systems, the drinking bird, Stirling engines, internal combustion engines, air conditioners, heat pumps, and and refrigerators. So entropy and the second law of thermodynamics addresses issues as practical as the efficiency of your lawnmower's engine all the way up to evolution versus creationism debates and the ultimate heat death of the universe. Here's my favorite flow chart and who doesn't like a good flow chart? This is from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. It shows where the United States gets its energy from and how it uses it. An energy quad is equivalent to one quadrillion British thermal units. The left side shows where we get our energy from. The thicker the line, the greater the source. You can see the thickest lines are petroleum and natural gas. Coal is pretty thick, but it's definitely getting thinner. Renewable energy sources like solar, hydro, wind, geothermal, and biomass are relatively thin, but they're definitely getting thicker as time goes by. Nuclear is an interesting category. Do you think nuclear is a renewable or non-renewable energy source? Do you think it's green or not green. We apply all of these sources of energy to electricity generation, industrial uses like manufacturing processes, and transportation. All of this is interesting, but it's the right side of this flow chart that, to me, is the most interesting. Look at this huge amount of rejected energy. The second law of thermodynamics says there's always going to be some amount of wasted energy. On the other hand, we're not even close to that limit. A lot of this rejected Projected energy is due to inefficiencies that could be eliminated. Improving efficiency is essential, and to understand efficiency, you have to have a thorough knowledge of entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. Here are six ways to describe entropy. Entropy is a state variable as opposed to a process variable like heat and work. It's one of the six state variables, along with internal energy, temperature, pressure, volume, and enthalpy. We don't get into enthalpy here in this class. It's a measure of the loss in capability to do work. It's a ratio of heat to temperature. For gases with no external forces, entropy is a measure of the disorder of the system. We need to be careful with that term disorder. It's often used far too widely and we have to keep it narrowly applied to gases with no external forces. From a statistical thermodynamics point of view, entropy is a measure of the multiplicity of a system. Finally, entropy is times arrow. If you put an ice cube on a hot surface, you see it melt. It's not likely that you see water sitting on a hot surface spontaneously form an ice cube. Here's the entropy postulate. This is a great time to remind you guys to learn as you transcribe. We're going to talk about several of these terms in a lot more detail, specifically the terms closed system and reversible as well as irreversible processes. The entropy postulate basically says entropy is a one-way street. It's not conserved like momentum. It's constantly increasing. It does say it remains constant for reversible processes. However, there are no reversible processes. That's a theoretical construct. Let's talk about the change in entropy for an adiabatic free expansion. Here's what's happening. I have a perfectly insulated chamber. The left side contains my working substance, a gas in this case. There's a valve that separates the left chamber from the right chamber, and my right chamber initially is a perfect vacuum. The entire system is perfectly 
insulated, which means no heat flows in or flows out. That's what it means to be an adiabatic process. This is my initial state. I then decide to open the valve and notice that the gas starts spreading out to occupy both the left and right chambers. Now we can talk about the term irreversible process. Once this valve is opened, the gas will naturally spread out to occupy both chambers. You'll never see the situation shown in this bottom diagram showing the spread out gas spontaneously reform into the top situation where I have all of my gas particles located in the left chamber. There's no law of physics saying that can't happen, but it is extremely unlikely that it will happen. If I wanted to, I could spend some energy to move the gas in the right chamber back to the left chamber. There's nothing wrong with that, but it does require some external energy. There are a lot of practical engineering examples that would accomplish this, but again, they all would require some external energy investment. Here's my problem. I can't make a PV diagram showing what happens as the gas spreads from the left to right chamber. As this process is taking place, there's no homogeneity or uniformity. My pressure, volume, and temperature readings depend on where I'm taking that reading. This precludes me from making an accurate PV diagram. So here's what I'm going to do. Because entropy is a state function, meaning it's path independent or has no memory about how it got to its present condition, I use the following definition of entropy. This is the Clausius definition. I'm going to look at the ratio of heat flow to temperature at an initial condition and a final condition and integrate along the path. Because I don't know the path for an adiabatic free expansion, I'm going to substitute in another process where I do know the path and has the same initial and final conditions. Notice the units for entropy, joules per Kelvin. Because my adiabatic free expansion is not in equilibrium during the expansion from the initial to final states, I'm going to instead use an isothermal expansion starting at the same initial state and terminating at the same final state. Let me recap isothermal expansion. My system is sitting on a thermal reservoir. I remove one teeny tiny lead pellet. The system expands. It wants to cool down, expansion cooling, but it's not allowed to cool down because the reservoir will contribute some heat. So look at my final state. My volume has increased. It turns out my pressure has decreased and there's no change in internal energy because my thermal reservoir kept the temperature unchanged. And we remember that if temperature doesn't change, internal energy does not change. This is great news. Again, I'm going to have this isothermal expansion process start at the same initial state and terminate at the same final state as the adiabatic free expansion. Because I'm going to carry out this process super slowly, it's always in a state of equilibrium, which means I can plot it as a function on a PV diagram. If I can plot it as a function, I can integrate. Here's what I just said in in detail and repetitively. This is it. Notice how I start off with the definition of entropy. I pull out the variable T because it turns out T is constant. Again, isothermal expansion. Temperature does not change in an adiabatic free expansion, nor does it change in an isothermal expansion. The integral of dQ is Q. I replace Q with this term, and at this point you should pause the recording and ask yourself, where did this come from? We actually derive this expression for isothermal work. Because the change in internal energy is zero for an isothermal process and the change in internal energy equals Q minus W. Q equals work equals NRT natural log of the argument V final over V initial. Go back and relive those derivations. So we now have an expression for entropy for an adiabatic free expansion and an isothermal process. In the case of an isothermal process, it could be an isothermal expansion or an isothermal compression. Let's get into the tactics. When we need to analyze an irreversible process, we're going to replace it with a suitable reversible process. We're going to learn what constitutes a suitable process, and we're going to use the same initial and final states. Here we go. As mentioned, we replace the irreversible adiabatic free expansion with a reversible isothermal process. So this expression for change in entropy applies to the adiabatic free expansion as well as to an isothermal expansion or 
for isothermal compression. Let's look at the isobaric process. Go back to the drawing board. Start off with the expression for change in entropy. I know for an isobaric process, Q equals NCP delta T, so I'll use the differential form of that and plug in DQ equals NCP DT. So this box gives you a couple of different ways to calculate the change in entropy for an isobaric process. This could be an expansion or a compression. Moving on to the isochoric process. Start with the basic definition for change in entropy. Make the appropriate substitution. In this case, I know Q equals NCV delta T for an isochoric process. So DQ would equal NCV DT. Make the substitutions, solve the integral, and evaluate the integral, and you get these two expressions for the change in entropy for an isochoric process. Box 4. What's the change in entropy for a solid or a liquid that gain or lose heat? I remember from chapter 18, Q equals MC delta T, so the differential version becomes DQ equals MC DT. Solve the integral, evaluate, and this is what you get for the change in entropy when a solid or a liquid absorb heat across a given temperature range. Box 5. What's the change in entropy for a phase change process? I remember for the transformation between a solid and a liquid, Q equals ML subscript F, where L subscript F is the latent heat of fusion. For the transformation between a liquid and a gas, I remember Q equals ML subscript V, where L subscript V is the latent heat of vaporization. This is pretty straightforward, and there's your expression for the change in entropy that occurs during a phase change process. Box number six, what's the change in entropy for a reversible adiabatic process? The answer is zero. There is no change for a reversible adiabatic process because there's no heat that flows into or out of the system. Entropy is the ratio of heat flow to temperature. No heat flow means no change in entropy. The term isentropic refers to a process where there's no change in entropy. The second law of thermodynamics. Let's go back to the concept of entropy. Here are some synonyms. Disorder, randomness, chaos. You could even add craziness or mixed upness or violence to the list. We've seen that adding heat to a gas tends to increase its level of chaos. There seems to be a link between entropy and heat. In fact, that's the basis of our definition for change in entropy. I'm repeating this definition here just for reinforcement. Let's look at this isothermal expansion and contraction and tabulate what's happening with entropy. At initial state I, I remove one of those teeny tiny little lead pellets, also known as lead shot. The piston rises. There's a tendency for expansion cooling, but cooling does not take place because heat flows in from the reservoir. So there's a gain in entropy for my gas during this process. Heat is flowing into the system at a constant temperature that increases the gas's entropy. Still looking at initial state I, the same amount of heat that flowed into my gas left the surroundings. So the entropy of the surroundings diminished by the same amount. From the perspective of the universe, there's no change in entropy whatsoever during this isothermal expansion. Look at box B. I now add a little teeny tiny lead pellet to the container. The piston gets pushed down. There's a tendency for compression heating, but that doesn't happen because heat flows from my gas to the thermal reservoir. So for this case, isothermal compression, heat flows out of my gas and into the reservoir. The entropy of my gas diminishes, but the entropy of the surroundings increases by the same amount. Again, from the universe's perspective, there's no change in entropy for this isothermal contraction. If this were indeed a perfectly reversible process, there would be no change whatsoever in the universe's entropy. In the real world, if I remove a lead pellet from the container, the entropy of the gas would increase and the entropy of the surroundings would diminish, as I just mentioned. But the increase in the gas's entropy more than compensates for the reduction of entropy in the surroundings. So from the universe's perspective, this expansion actually increases the entropy of the universe. You might be thinking, well, we can compensate for that during the reverse process. I add a lead pellet to the container, the piston lowers, heat leaves the gas and enters the surroundings. In practice, the reduction of entropy of the gas is less than the increase of entropy in the surroundings. So once again, the entropy of the universe has increased. Unlike the theoretical reversible process, all real thermodynamics 
thermodynamic processes, not just isothermal, any thermodynamic process increases the entropy of the universe. It's a one-way streak. This is not a conservation law. All processes increase the net entropy of the universe. Let's look at some equivalent statements of the second law of thermodynamics. Here's the definition, which you've seen several times already. Know that entropy always increases or in isolated localized circumstances remains constant. You might decide to go clean your bedroom and think you're reducing the universe's entropy, but the heat you generate cleaning your bedroom more than compensates for the reduction of entropy resulting from your clean bedroom. The Clausius statement, it's not possible for heat to spontaneously flow from a colder body to a warmer body without work having been done to accomplish this flow. What's an example? Your refrigerator. An electric motor actually does work to cause heat to flow from an already cold environment to the already warmer surroundings. Kelvin Planck's statement, it's impossible to take some heat from a hot reservoir and use all of it to do work. Some amount of heat must be exhausted to a cold reservoir. There's always some waste heat. Carnot's principle, the efficiency of a perfect engine depends only on the temperatures of the two heat reservoirs. All real engines are less efficient. This is saying that for a thermodynamically perfect engine, it's the temperature difference that determines efficiency, and despite being thermodynamically perfect, it's not 100% efficient. Real engines are always less efficient than Carnot engines, and a Carnot engine is never 100% efficient. Entropy is the arrow of time. Changing entropy is the only way we know time flows. Every system left to itself will change towards a condition of maximum entropy. The universe is inexorably approaching maximum entropy, also known as thermal equilibrium. As mentioned, there are isolated localities where entropy can decrease, but the universe's entropy always increases. In chemistry, if it increases the universe's entropy, a reaction will occur spontaneously. The universe continues to expand, continues to become more chaotic and disordered, continues to cool, and will at some point in the future experience heat death. This last statement is saying we're mostly looking at entropy from a heat flow and physical responses point of view. There is a much more rigorous statistical approach that uses pretty deep mathematics, which many of you will move on to. Irreversible processes and entropy. This is largely a review page. Attaining a fundamental understanding of reversible and irreversible processes is a really foundational tenet of thermodynamics. Here's the recap of a reversible process. It occurs infinitely slowly. Pressure and temperature are uniform, meaning they're the same everywhere in the system. The system is always in a state of equilibrium. It's continuously plottable on a PV diagram. And when the process returns to the initial state, there's no change to either the system or the environment. Reversible processes don't exist. It's a theoretical construct. It basically provides the ultimate reference situation. Here's a pretty darn close to reversible process. You can see one of the key bullets is to eliminate losses, turbulence, friction, etc. That's an obvious goal for scientists and engineers wishing to devise the most efficient device or system possible. An irreversible process is a process where the temperature and pressure vary with location. Equilibrium is not maintained and this process cannot be plotted. Here are some causes of irreversibility. You can see the common thread is energy loss due to heat, which is the same thing as saying that there's a transition from ordered to disordered energy. Heat is considered disordered energy. It's hard to manage. It's like herding cats. Plastic deformation happens when you take something like a spring, for example, and you stretch it past the point of no return and it's permanently deformed. Elastic deformation means you stretch that spring and let go and it returns to its initial position. You're staying within the elastic limit. Everything else I think is pretty straightforward. This bullet, spontaneous chemical reaction, reminds me to remind you that chemical thermodynamics is a very large field within the realm of thermodynamics. There's classical thermodynamics, statistical thermodynamics, and chemical thermodynamics. Once again, here's the entropy postulate. Okay, that's pretty much it for the first half of this chapter. Now it's time to start the second half, which focuses on engines and engine efficiency. Let me show you a few seconds from a showcase video that one of my former students, Herman Shenju, 
produced as part of a special project. What do all the following have in common? This drinking bird. This hero engine that I made. This thermoelectric generator that is powered by the temperature difference between these two cups of water. Aha! This simple laboratory oh. engine. This model steam engine. This sterling engine powered by the heat from my hand. What do they all have in common? They all run on heat. And any device that does work for us and run on heat is called a heat engine. There are many other examples. Refrigerators, air conditioners, and heat pumps are also examples of heat engines. Think of them as heat engines in reverse. They obey all the same laws of thermodynamics. Heat pumps are interesting. They're both heaters and coolers. Here is a schematic of a heat engine showing the basic elements and basic flow directions of heat engines. Hot heat from a hot temperature reservoir flows into the engine. The engine takes that hot heat and uses some of it to do useful work and rejects the remainder to a low temperature reservoir. Heat engines are constrained by the second law to exhaust some energy to a cold reservoir. There's always going to be some rejected heat no matter how efficient the heat engine. Heat engines rely on a working substance. In the preceding video segment, Herman showed us a drinking bird and a Stirling engine. Both of those run on air. In a steam engine, the working substance is obviously steam. In an internal combustion engine, the working substance is a gas-air mixture. Heat engines run repetitively. They operate in a cycle. Engine math refers to the practice of expressing all heat transfer values as positive. We remember the convention that says heat flowing into a system is positive and heat leaving a system is negative. When we calculate efficiency, we're going to work with the magnitudes of heat flows. Because heat engines run in cycles, they always return to the same state from which they started. For one cycle, there is no change in internal energy, so the work that gets produced is equal to the heat energy going in minus the rejected heat going out. Greek letter eta is usually used to represent efficiency. Efficiency is always what you want over how much you pay for it. In this case, what we want is work, and we're going to pay for it in terms of hot heat. Heat coming from our hot reservoir is basically our currency. We use it to pay for useful work. This expression for heat engine efficiency comes from using this expression for work, which simplifies to this expression for heat engine efficiency. Remember, in general, efficiency is what you want versus how much you pay for it, and these are specific expressions of efficiency for thermodynamic processes. Let's start with nature's most perfect engine, the Carnot engine, named after Sadi Carnot, who is definitely in the thermodynamics hall of fame. Here's a schematic drawing of a Carnot engine, meaning this is a simplified and abstract representation of an engine. You feed this engine some heat, the engine does some work, and the engine has to expel some amount of wasted heat. Think of the human body as an example. You wake up, you eat a banana, that banana's stored chemical energy is converted to heat, that heat does work, which is manifested, for example, by you running up a flight of stairs, and in the process, you waste some heat, some heat just radiates off off your body into the surroundings. Think of an automobile engine. You feed your engine some gas, that gas is made to explode, that explosion generates heat, that heat does work, and some of that heat is wasted via your exhaust pipe or just radiating off the engine block. Here's how you would draw this with a paper and pencil. Hot heat from a hot reservoir is fed to your engine, work is the output, and cold heat at a cold temperature is expelled into a cold reservoir. Here's a table of the full names of each variable you see. Okay, let's go through this table. 
This is a really dense and laborious table. Once you finish it and come out the other side, you're going to have a lot of great insight into Carnot engines. Carnot engines are extremely foundational to the field of thermodynamics. It's time for the reminder, learn as you transcribe. Let's look at the transition from state A to state B. My system is in physical contact with a reservoir. The piston rises and heat flows from the reservoir into the system. This looks like an isothermal expansion. Let's fill out the first row of this table. Going from state A to state B is an isothermal expansion. My volume increases, so delta V is plus. Heat flows into the system, so by convention we call that positive. There is no change in temperature. Again, if there's a tendency to heat up or cool down, the reservoir will prevent that from happening. All of this is happening while the system is in physical contact with the hot temperature reservoir, which provides hot heat. Work is positive. The system is doing work on its environment. If we start with the definition of change in entropy, integrate and evaluate it, this is what we get. The entropy of this system has increased. Make sure you pay special attention to these subscripts. They're critically important. Okay, let's look at what's happening from state B to state C. My system is now perfectly thermally insulated. The piston rises from its already raised height to an even greater height. This looks like an adiabatic expansion. Expansion because the volume is increasing, adiabatic because no heat flows into or out of the system. I know pressure is going to decrease, volume is going to increase, temperature is going to decrease, and internal energy is going to decrease. What happens from energy state C to energy state D? My system is once again in physical contact with a reservoir. I'm calling this a cold reservoir because my system right now is at a cold temperature relative to the transition from state A to state B where it was at a hot temperature. The piston lowers. There's a tendency for compression heating, but the reservoir again prevents that from happening. Heat flows from the system to the reservoir. My pressure increases. My volume decreases. My temperature remains constant. My internal energy remains constant. This again looks like an isothermal compression. From state D to state A, I once again thermally insulate my system. The piston lowers. No heat flows in or out because it's perfectly insulated. The pressure increases. The volume decreases. The temperature increases. The internal energy increases. And this looks like an adiabatic compression. Let's jump to the last row. When my system goes from state D back to state A, that represents an adiabatic contraction. My volume diminishes, so delta V is negative. There's no heat flow, so Q is zero. My temperature increases, so delta T is plus. This is compression heating. And the temperature of my system transitions from a cold state to a hot state. Make sure you're really meticulous with these subscripts. Work is negative. The environment is doing work on my system. The piston falls, which means theta equals 180. There's no change in entropy. If no heat flows into or out of the system, Delta S equals zero. Okay, you finished the table for the process beginning at state B and ending at state C, and also for the process beginning at state C and finishing at state D. As you complete these rows, make sure you have a complete understanding of what's going on. Worry about subscripts, worry about transition names, and don't take anything on face value. Be on the lookout for mistakes that you might need to correct or any piece of content that might not be perfectly clear to you. Okay, here's the really well-known PV diagram for a Carnot cycle. Your job is to annotate this with all the information specified here in this box. Here's that version. I can't stress how important it is for you to draw this yourself by hand. You might think to just include a screen snip of this content, but going through the time and trouble of redrawing all of this information on your own diagram is far more effective, especially if you are really thinking about what it is you're drawing and writing as you draw it and write it. The one thing you don't see on this diagram is work. Positive work happens from state A to state B and from state B to state C. Negative work happens from state C to state D and again from state D to state 
date A. Figure out how to label that on your diagram and know that work is represented as the shaded area under each one of these four processes. The shaded area segments under process A to B and process B to C represent positive work and the shaded area underneath process C to D and D to A represent negative work. And now we need to spend a lot of time and effort deriving the Carnot engine efficiency. Efficiency is obviously important to any scientist or engineer. It's almost always a primary design goal. The more efficient, the better. From a learning point of view, if you can figure out how to determine the efficiency of a process, you're going to end up having a deep knowledge of that process. Robotically copying this content from the screen onto your own sheets provides pretty much no benefit. Make sure you learn as you transcribe. Okay, in boxes one through seven, I'm closely examining what's happening during that first isothermal expansion process from state A to state B. Going from box one to box four gives me an expression for the work that occurred from state A to state B. Box five, six, and seven let me figure out how much heat is entering the system from state A to state B. Boxes eight through 11 show me how to figure out the total amount of work done during the isothermal compression from state C to state state D. Boxes 12, 13, and 14 let me figure out how much heat left the system during this isothermal compression. Box 15 deserves some special attention. I'm inverting the argument of that ln function. If I do that, I don't change the value, I just change the sign. When dealing with efficiencies, I just want to deal with magnitudes. Instead of taking the absolute value, I'll just invert the argument to the ln function. In box 16, I'm taking the ratio of qc to qh. This is the ratio of the heat leaving the system during the isothermal compression to the heat entering the system during the isothermal expansion. I'll use this later. We just finished the two isothermal processes. Time to examine the two adiabatic processes. Let's look at the adiabatic expansion that occurs from state B to state C. Boxes 17, 18A, and 18B rely on the adiabatic temperature volume relationship. I went from box 18A to box 18 B by updating the generic subscripts in 18A with the specific subscripts that apply to this Carnot process in 18B. Make sure all of that makes sense. Three processes down, one more to go. The adiabatic compression that happens between state D and state A. Box 20A is the generic temperature volume adiabatic relationship. 20B is identical to 20A, but again with updated subscripts to reflect the specifics of the Carnot process that we're looking at here. In box 21, I'm taking the ratio of my two adiabatic processes. You can see how it reduces to a really simple expression of volume ratios. I can use this later as well. Box 22 is a major milestone. For a Carnot process, the ratio of heats is equal to the ratio of temperatures. You might say to yourself, well, of course, that seems like it makes sense. That seems intuitive, but it's not. We had to show this using 21 boxes of derivation, and it applies applies only to Carnot processes, a Carnot engine, a Carnot refrigerator, a Carnot air conditioner, etc. A really common mistake students make is to try to use the expression in box 22 for a process that isn't specifically known to be a Carnot process. Keep that in mind. Okay, box 23 is the finish line. In general, efficiency is what you get over what you pay for. That's true for everything, not just thermodynamics. It's common to use this Greek letter eta, E-T-A, to represent efficiency. So if efficiency is what you get over what you pay for and what you get is work, how do you pay for it? You pay for it in terms of heat investment. So from a general thermodynamics point of view, efficiency is the work you get out divided by your heat investment going in. Let's go back to the basic schematic for a heat engine, a circle with three lines. The first law of thermodynamics says the change in internal energy equals Q minus W, which is basically saying energy in equals energy out. That's, in essence, the conservation of energy. So in a heat engine, what's going in? The answer is input heat. That could come from the explosion of a gas-air mixture or result from a metabolic process in your body. What goes out? The answer is work and wasted heat. So hot heat energy goes in, work and rejected heat energy comes out. That's the first law. Let me rearrange to isolate work. Work, W, equals QH minus QC. In essence, work is the difference between the input heat and the wasted heat. Let me talk for a minute about engine 
math. Let's take the absolute value or the magnitudes of all heat terms. We know that heat coming into a system is positive and heat leaving a system is negative. But in the case of efficiency calculations, let's use magnitudes. You can see here that I just need to subtract cold heat from hot heat to get the difference. So it all works out. That's how I can go from this expression for efficiency to this expression for efficiency. You can see I can simplify this expression to get one minus the ratio of wasted heat to input heat. All of these efficiency expressions are applicable to any thermodynamic engine. This expression here is applicable only to Carnot engines. This is one reason why we spent so much time on boxes 1 through 22. Look at box 22. I take that relationship and I substitute it into this expression and that's how I get the Carnot efficiency. You can see it's 1 minus the temperature ratio. You can also see that the greater the difference between reservoir temperatures, the greater the efficiency. This is why jet engines are a lot more efficient than lawnmower engines. The temperature extremes in a jet engine are far greater than they are for a lawnmower engine. One more time, use this Carnot efficiency expression only for Carnot systems. Everything else in box 23 you can use for general purpose thermodynamic efficiency calculations. Let's talk about some essential takeaways for Carnot engines. Because the temperature of the hot reservoir is necessarily greater than the temperature of a cold reservoir, we can say the amount of heat going into a Carnot engine must be greater than the amount of heat coming out of a Carnot engine. This isn't as trivial as you might think. More heat is absorbed at a high temperature than expelled at a low temperature. Carnot efficiency is always less than 100%. Remember what a Carnot engine is. It is the perfect thermodynamic engine. Even though it's perfect, it can never be 100% efficient. No real engine can have an efficiency greater than the Carnot efficiency. It's an upper limit. It's very useful because it gives scientists and engineers a target to shoot for. Carnot engines are perfect engines, yet not perfectly efficient. Okay, here is a really comprehensive comprehensive thermodynamics summary table. Your job is to use this sheet of clues, which I'll post as a separate link, and complete every entry in that summary table yourself. This should take you quite a while. It's a really valuable chore and will really reinforce your understanding.